Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this press conference from the 48th annual meeting here in Davos. It's the third day of the meeting. Uh, a lot has happened already this week, and uh, we're, we're adding to this exciting agenda with a wonderful announcement today here. So welcome to you here in the room, and welcome to our audience on the live stream, whether you're watching on the website, Facebook, or Periscope. Thank you for tuning in. This press conference is, is dedicated to the launch of an exciting new partnership to deliver last mile healthcare. <clears throat> um, it is uh, a wonderful panel I'm uh, presenting to you now, to my immediate left. Uh, we're joined by Catherine Milligan. She's the head of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, uh, which operates under the umbrella of the World Economic Forum. Uh, next to her, we're joined by Raj Punjabi, the chief executive officer of Last Mile Health and a Schwab social entrepreneur. Uh, right in the heart and center of our panel, we are joined by Chuck Slaughter, who is the founder of Living Goods and also a member of our social entrepreneur community. And last but definitely not least, we're joined by Huberto Scoops. He is the head of UBS and society um, here from Switzerland, of course. Thank you very much uh, for, for being here. Um, Without further ado, uh, Raj, let me jump to you. Um, what is the exciting announcement you have to make today? Please share with us. Well, thank you, Georg. Uh, we are proud to be part of this extraordinary partnership and part of the inspiring community of Schwab Foundation Social Entrepreneurs. Today, we know that illness is universal and access to care is not. Last month, in fact, the World Bank and the World Health Organization released a report that revealed that the world, ha over half of the world's population, 3.67 billion people lack access to essential health services like prenatal care, vaccines, and treatment for malaria. And what's worse is the world lacks access to the health workers, lacks the health workers needed to close this gap. In fact, we are experiencing the greatest health worker shortage in history. Today, we lack more than 7 million health workers. That's a number that is forecast to more than double to an 18 million health worker shortage by 2030. Now, we believe that the power of mobile technology makes it possible, makes it possible for us to transform this problem. Virtually every other sector, from retail to banking to taxis, has been reinvented by mobile technology. Now we believe it's time for technology to help reinvent access to healthcare for the poor. So we are empowering community health workers with mobile technology. We're helping them to save more lives. In partnership with governments and visionary funders like UBS, we are deploying thousands of community health workers with simple but powerful digital tools to deliver quality healthcare door to door these women are delivering professional care for their neighbors far faster and at far lower cost than ever before. Our Smart Health app automates diagnoses for, of the deadliest conditions, helping ensure that we can capture accurate, real-time data to help manage thousands of far-flung health workers. And the Community Health Academy will provide a powerful new digital education solution that brings training into the palm of community health workers' hands. We've been at this, Raj and I, for, for 10 years, and we've proven the impact of this digital-enabled health worker model. Number one, and most importantly, it saved lives. A randomized control trial is showing that this model is reducing child mortality by over 25%. Number two, it's incredibly cheap. We can deliver this comprehensive home care for as little as $2 a year per person. And third, it's important, it's why we're here, it's super scalable. In just the last three years, Living Goods has scaled up from 1 million to 5 million people served. And in West Africa, um, Last Mile Health is training the next 4,000 community health workers. And four, it can stop pandemics. Raj and his team literally risked their lives on the front lines of the Ebola crisis. And they know all too well that capturing data on home health in real time is the key to halting outbreaks before they become deadly pandemics. And last and importantly, it's creating jobs and empowering women. 
Deploying health workers saves lives, yes, but it's also creating livelihoods for thousands of women, building their confidence, building their financial security, and their status in their communities. Now, what we're excited to announce is a dream team, really, of visionary philanthropists, including Richard Branson, Jeff Skoll, the Elma Foundation, and Chris Hahn of the Children's Investment Fund Foundation are committing $50 million in a challenge grant to kick off a shared campaign to deploy 50,000 of these empowered community health workers to reach 34 million people over six countries. Now to unlock this magic commitment, uh, Raj and I have to go find another $50 million from new sources over the next four years. But this is an exciting challenge because for uh, new backers, the offer oper offers the opportunity to double the impact of their investments. Now, on behalf of all those we serve, we're really thrilled to be here with UPS, who is stepping up in a bold way to make the first major commitment to this campaign. This is a bit unusual. You know, we know typically in, in the social sector, it's, it's not uncommon for philanthropy to be a bit siloed, uh, bureaucratic, but this collaboration is showing it really doesn't have to be that way. It shows how business and philanthropy can be both collaborative and nimble, humane and hard-nosed. And it shows that when committed caring partners link arms, that big change is really possible. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck, and uh, also thank you, Raj. Let me, let me, I guess, begin really by, by framing one more time what this is really about. This is about bringing health care to 34 million people who don't have it today. Um, that's a really significant number, and that is exactly the type of thing that um, the clients of UBS want to have an impact on. We, as the world's leading wealth manager, we think we have a role to play in helping things like this come to fruition. And as a result of that, actually, we've been working with our clients for many, many years because we know from studies that we've done, um, the last one actually just a few years ago, that 90% of UBS's clients are involved in philanthropy in some way, shape, or form. Um, but only 20% of them think it's being done effectively or they're doing it effectively. Um, what we're also seeing is that uh, maybe a few years ago, a client may have said, I'm happy to build a healthcare center you know, somewhere in Africa to make sure that a local community is served. Um, or they'd say, I'm happy to have a few wells dug to make sure that there's clean drinking water in a village. Today, um, their ambitions are much, much bolder. They want to make sure that they give smartly with a lot of impact, and they don't want to solve the healthcare issue in a particular town or a particular city. They would like to tackle the issue that one billion people don't have access to healthcare. And so that's why we are pledging today and stepping up to say, um, as, as Chuck just, just outlined, um, they have a 50 million commitment, but they need another 50. What we will be doing is we will be granting 10 million from UBS for every $1 that we give, or sorry, we'll turn it around the other way, for every $2 that our clients give, we will match that with $1 up to an amount of 10 million. So that means in total out of that, we should get around 30 million. Um, that would contribute to this cause. So 10 million from UBS, another 20 million from our clients um, should, should help Raj and Chuck get started. Now, um, for us, this is not something new and it's not something that we haven't uh, organized in, in a similar fashion in the past. The way that we will do this is through the UBS Optimus Foundation, which is a foundation that we've had for, since 1999, um, which currently has 180 projects globally, 150 million in grants under management, and about 3,000 of our, of our high net worth and ultra high net worth clients give to the foundation every year. Last year we had grants up to 60 million, which we then grant back out right away. And um, interestingly, and not coincidentally, um, both Raj and Chuck's organizations have been organizations that we've granted to um, for quite a few years. We actually worked very, very closely with Raj in, in his, really when he was in his, in his building up phase of Last Mile Health, and we're on the ground with him very, very early in um, Liberia when, when Ebola hit. And we've been also working with Chuck for quite some time uh, in, in Uganda. So for us, this is, this is, a, you know, this is a, a, a process that we've been through in the past and that um, we're very, very familiar with, which is also why I'm quite confident that we will be able to get the match from our clients. I think 
I'll leave it at that. Um, we are open for your questions if uh, there are any here in the room. Thank you, Hubertus. First of all, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Catherine. Um, I mentioned already that, that Jack and Raj are part of the, of the Schwab Foundation uh, of, of Social Entrepreneurs. Um, but let me ask you a simple question. Why is the World Economic Forum uh, actually engaged in that area, and what's the work the community is doing? Thank you. So Klaus and Hilde Schwab, uh, of course, um, Professor Klaus Schwab, the executive chairman and founder of the World Economic Forum, and his wife Hilde created the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship 20 years ago. Uh, today, social entrepreneurship is a widely um, understood term. Back then, it really wasn't, uh, but they felt that there was a critical voice missing in Davos. Although we had brought civil society uh, leaders uh, for decades, um, uh, even uh, by that point. And that's really these entrepreneurs, these uh, visionary leaders who were and are, continue to leverage market forces and business principles to solve social problems uh, as distinct from charity. And that was, you know, sort of the origin uh, of, the, uh, of the idea and of the foundation of the community. And so for now 20 years, the Schwab Foundation has been selecting and engaging um, outstanding social entrepreneurs, bringing them together uh, with each other uh, for peer support, for collaboration, but also critically with, um, uh, for partnership with other key stakeholders of the World Economic Forum. Uh, so throughout this week, of course, you're meeting not only with <coughs> philanthropic partners, uh, others are meeting with business partners, but Critically, there's the role that the public sector has to play as well. Um, and that might be health ministries in this case, uh, it might be um, other ministries, education ministries in other cases. But we are seeing more and more of this kind of large scale population change, what we would call system change, that social entrepreneurs as the innovators are able to drive, not in isolation, but in partnership with other key stakeholders. So I just want to congratulate you both for your dedication and, uh, and your commitment, and um, really want to take this opportunity also to congratulate UBS uh, for coming in to this very exciting partnership. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and allow myself to get a question in first. Um, you, you mentioned women, right? Um, and we had uh, Chetna Sinha, another uh, of your uh, members of the community. Uh, she she um, is also co-chair this year. Yeah. She spoke about uh, working with women particularly. And uh, Mohammed Yunus if, is, uh, is famously always saying, I'm only giving money uh, to women. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit on that aspect? Well, there's, I mean, I'd, I'd start with this. There's, it, it's, it's very well known that um, interventions in healthcare and livelihoods, when they're focused on the female head of household, just uh, deliver far greater benefits to the family than when they're focused primarily on the male head of household. Um, and think again about the work that we're doing. It's focused pr uh, tr uh, tremendously on children um, and on pregnant mothers. And so that's really our customer. So from a, just from a business and a behavior change point of view, we're going to get a lot farther and a lot faster if we use a woman as the agent of change when we're trying to change uh, behaviors and, and mothers and children. And, and to give an example of, of, of uh, Chuck's points, the, 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 there's, there's a woman I was just working with, one of um, the Kami health workers in Liberia, and her name's Musu. Uh, Musu lives in a village that is um, about four hours away from the nearest clinic. Uh, she, she was, you know, t about 25 percent of Liberian women have a chance to finish primary school, only 25 percent. But Musu had been persistent. She'd finished high school by the age of 18, and when she came back to her community, what she found were children in her village dying from conditions no one should die from in the 21st century, malaria, pneumonia. Now, she was a leader, someone who wanted to take care of her community. And the power of mobile technology, the advances we've seen in the, uh, in the healthcare industry with point of care diagnostic tests, you can equip her with a $1 rapid test kit for malaria. You can give her a backpack full of medicines that can treat those patients. And you can provide, as we are in this partnership, a smartphone for her uh, to help her automate diagnosis so that she's treating and providing quality of care. Now, with all of that, uh, someone like Musu um, went from some, being someone who cared about her community and wanting to do something about it to actually being able to do something about it. And importantly, 
being able to have a chance to get a job, which is absolutely essential right now uh, in this fractured world, is to be able to invest in human capital, invest in people, and provide jobs. So someone like Musu and now thousands and soon to be tens of thousands of workers like her, women in these communities, uh, will have a chance to, to have careers as health workers. Thank you. Maybe, maybe let me add one more thing I think that um, is, has been stressed a lot at this WEF, but I think it's, it's important to repeat it here. Um, and that's also the point that you mentioned, uh, Chuck, that the key here is really to have people work together and collaborate. I mean, the two of you run, in a way, very similar you know, approaches, but um, didn't start together. You started independently of each other. Um, Raj is a Harvard-educated doctor. You are a very successful entrepreneur bringing you two together even from a from a you know point of, of having two experts that are very complementary is, is a fantastic start then you have a lot of experience in uganda you have the experience in liberia you both worked with mobile technology but you have had slightly different approaches and marrying that is what we find so attractive is that you know you get two experts who have proven that they can do it slightly different approaches who now tweak and push each other to bring health care to 34 million people and that's what excites us and the, yeah, I, should, I should point out that um, from a partnership point of view, there's a big fundamental partner who's not represented at this table right now, and that's in, both in West Africa and in East Africa, our government partners. Yeah. So this, is, this work is only possible when we do it in very close collaboration with the national governments, counties, districts. Um, and really, this is not an NGO-centered activity. These are partners coming together to support a na national community health systems. And so from an operational point of view, a policy point of view, and a financing point of view. This only works when you have government, when you have civil society, and business all uh, coming together. Thank you. I'd like to invite you just for one minute to maybe elaborate on the point of technology, because yes. especially our online audience might not be familiar mm. how you actually uh, do the work on the ground. Maybe you can uh, yes. expand on the technology aspect yeah. a little bit. Um, so it's, it's rather simple. So we provide an Android phone to every one of these community health workers, and that phone has a simple um, app on it, we call it Smart Health, and the app allows them to do an automated diagnosis for three of the leading uh, killer diseases in Africa, malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia, and it helps them register and triage pregnancies. It's a big part of the impact. Um, and when they, uh, when they finish that um, uh, diagnosis and registration, the app will then give specific instructions to the parent and to the health worker about what medicine should be prescribed, um, whether the patient should be referred, um, but it doesn't stop there. The app will, if, it's prescribed, if you prescribe a medicine, the app will send automated messages to the mother about when to, uh, each day to complete the course of treatment. And if they're referred to a facility, it sends messages to help them uh, follow up. But the other, the other very important piece um, is it's not just a diagnostic and support tool for the health worker. It provides an end-to-end -end performance management system for the health system. Uh, so this is a big challenge. These women are working in very far-flung remote locations. It's very hard to supervise them. And now their managers, the manager's managers, and even the funders behind this can see the performance of these health workers in real time, and literally on any device anywhere. And so before digital, that sort of performance management feedback could, was all done on paper. It was fairly inaccurate, and it could take up to two months. We're now getting that literally on a day-to-day -day basis. And the other aspect of this, you know, be, uh, being a physician, I think, uh, you know, as you heard Chuck say, you know, this is coming after 10 years of building strong health systems. So this isn't dropping smartphones and parachutes to try to uh, uh, have community members save lives. This is uh, the best marriage between what is already a high-touch activity, which is healthcare, and high-tech. Mm -hmm. um, so many industries are worried about automation stealing jobs. This is a place where automation is creating jobs. And in addition to the performance management, uh, uh, Smart Health app, the uh, Community Health Academy uh, will provide digital training solutions for these workers. So doctors like me can now use smartphones around the world to keep up with the latest in medical science to be able to provide the best care to my patients. Well, community health workers to date are living in rural communities like Musu's where to get the next training, uh, the next skill, uh, she has to get in a canoe, paddle up river, four hours, get to a health center to get care. When she gets there, she's being trained with flip charts and markers. You know, why shouldn't community health workers like Musu have the same access to quality education as I do? And again, there, 
these smartphones are making it possible. We're partnering in this collaboration with Digital Campus, uh, which has developed a uh, open source mobile application called Appia Mobile that is providing video and audio uh, instruction, uh, supplementing the instruction that these workers get from nurses on the hands of smartphones. And we're starting this month with, um, with a module on pneumonia to help. Uh, it kills one out, of, uh, one out of five deaths, preventable deaths amongst children in these communities is due to pneumonia, simple lung infection that can go wrong and get worse. We know the treatment, but sometimes community health workers have a hard time diagnosing it. Um, and so these, the smartphone will actually provide video showing how kids uh, uh, with pneumonia look when they're breathing difficultly so that community health workers like Musu can identify those workers more quickly. And, and sorry, just to tie this to a lot of what's happened, talk, being talked about at the forum this week, this, is a, this disruption is very similar to the disruptions you were seeing in so many other sectors. And where mobile is coming in, it's shifting power from institutions to individuals. So the old model in healthcare was when you got sick, you had to go, out, go trudge to a place, wait online, and hope that your medicine was in stock. The new model is more like what we've, consumers are expecting now from media, from mobile money. It's on demand, and it comes to them. So with this model, they call us. One of these health workers comes to them, and they use the technology to do a diagnosis in their home and then provide the medicine on the spot. And what does that get you from a health point of view? It means people are going to access care a lot faster. So the health systems are going to be burdened with far less acute and uh, complicated cases. And, fewer people are going to die because of it. Yeah, and and then maybe one, one final point on, on technology that's in, in, you know, really important from a, from a donor, from a philanthropic point of view, is that um, donors care about impact. They want to know what's been achieved. And in the past, that process is cumbersome, really, really difficult, paper-based, and you know, eats a lot of resources. With technology, it's far, far easier and far, far better. And so you can report back to the donors and say, this is the impact that you actually had. And you know, we've talked a lot about impact at this web as well. Impact measurement is a really, really key point in getting private money into solving causes like this. To drive that point home, uh, much, of course, of the conversation this week here at Davos has focused on the fourth industrial revolution, and I think there, um, you know, there is a risk that it feels very abstract, um, that it might exacerbate uh, tensions um, and the divide between haves and have-nots. But you know, really what we're seeing here and the agenda that we at the Schwa Foundation want to continue to advance um, throughout this year and beyond is really looking at how these emerging and disruptive technologies can be applied in a low income, low resource type of setting. This is a brilliant example of that, um, but there are so many examples of it that we as a community of social entrepreneurs have been exploring throughout the week. Um, including, you know, na natural language processing and machine learning to help uh, disabled people communicate, um, looking at um, artificial intelligence to help uh, refugees reconnect with their family members, looking at um, drones to be able to deliver critical medical supplies um, at lower cost. So it's not just about being able to measure the impact, it's also about being able to do it more cost effectively in difficult, challenging uh, places uh, to work. Uh, and so earlier this week, for example, we brought the social entrepreneurs community together with technology pioneers and tech experts to even look at applications like blockchain and artificial, artificial intelligence and what are the relevance for these types of models. So um, it's just it's super exciting to hear that uh, this is the direction that you're going in. Um, and I think it's going to be absolutely fundamental for people looking to solve social challenges that they're incorporating technology into the business models from the outset. Yeah, it's interesting. At the forum all this week, a question I often get is, geez, can you bring that to the U.S., to Europe? You know, I'd love to have my health care delivered to my, my door. And I think this is, could potentially be one of these examples where you have a peripheral technology that starts in the African market. Look at mobile money. It's a light year ahead in East Africa from where it is in the Western markets. We could be a pioneering a home health care model in, in, the, in the developed markets, which will migrate back in the developing markets, it'll migrate back to the developed markets. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah. Mindful of the time, um, yeah. uh, I know we haven't gotten to questions from the floor. Mm -hmm. um, if we could get the microphone here, mm -hmm. um, and if you could state your name and organization for the sake of our online audience, sure. please. Thanks. Uh, I'm Catherine Cheney, and I'm a reporter for DevEx. Um, so I'm glad that Chuck brought up government partners earlier, mm -hmm. and I'm curious to hear um, from both Raj and Chuck, what will this take? You know, I, I'm very... Um, 
cautious in stories about mobile technology to always make sure that, yes, technology is part of the solution, but we have to think about health systems and all these relevant players. So I'd love to hear from your perspective, what are some of the challenges you anticipate that you'll have to overcome to reach the kind of scale you want to reach? Um, and sort of what beyond technology will be critical to the su success of this, beyond technology and funding. Um, and then I'd love to hear a little bit more I, um, from the philanthropic perspective. I thought it was really interesting that you said um, seeing the impact is important um, to your clients. Um, what else about this particular um, mission is, is exciting to your clients? I'd love to hear how your clients look at this opportunity, among many things that they could consider. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I'm happy to start, Chuck. Please. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for that question. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. You know, so, so the, uh, the best, this is tech enabled, tech empowered, but it lies on the backbone of a strong um, infrastructure. And the infrastructure here is a human infrastructure, right? It's a networks of people from their own villages caring for their own neighbors that are tied to the rest of the healthcare system. So the first ingredient is partnership. Uh, in Liberia, we've been fortunate for the, over the last decade to partner with the government of Liberia and a host of other nonprofit actors like Partners in Health, International Rescue Committee, Plan International, Samaritan's Purse, all of whom are c c working together under one government plan to help the government of Liberia reach the last mile to reach the last million people who have no access to care because they live too far from a doctor, uh, but they're extending the government's healthcare system. If, if a health, if a, you know, this is critical because if if a Khmer health worker like Musu, for instance, finds a a child with pneumonia who needs to be hospitalized, she's tied to a nurse, who's tied to a clinic, who's tied to a hospital eventually. And so I think that is one piece. The second piece, and then I'll turn it over to Chuck. Um, I, I think is a is, is long-term engagement. Uh, you know, this uh, we we train these workers, we hire them, we equip them with uh, not just a smartphone, but the medical with medicines, with diagnostics. They're coached by nurses to be trained and supervised. Uh, they're recruited in selective ways to ensure their performance is high, and they're paid. And that's one critical thing with community health workers is that um, you know. Around the world, there's a debate whether they should be paid or not, uh, and yet there is increasing gaps in in uh, in our ability to provide jobs in the world. Uh, it makes no sense to us, from a healthcare perspective, not to uh, when you're short and going to be short 18 million health workers by 2030, doctors and nurses will be important to fill that void, but not enough. Uh, why not leverage uh, community members themselves? But it also makes so it makes sense practically to do that. Um, but it's also important for people to get paid for the work they do. And uh, I think one of the challenges in the health sector is that it's unclear with, just as in other sectors, when you have an informal, lower labor, lower skilled labor workforce, what the value of that workforce is. Well, as Chuck said, in his sites, they're seeing child mortality being cut by at least 25%. Uh, uh, in our sites, we're seeing access to uh, treatment for malaria, pneumonia, diarrhea increase by up to 60 percentage points. Uh, getting mothers into healthcare increased by up to, to up to 84 percent, where it was only 55 percent uh, in 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 research studies. Um, so it makes sense that if we can put the data more clearly, as Chuck said, into the hands of these ministries of health into healthcare systems decision makers to show them how valuable, according to the outcome these pay, uh, health workers achieve, that they're better outcomes even at a lower cost, if we can expose really that these workers are being undervalued, but then find a way to professionalize them, we can actually create value in, in the healthcare workforce through, through this. So th those are the pieces that I think are also important when, in addition to technology. Chuck, would you add anything? I, I, one word. Leadership, you know, um, we have a choice. You know, this this we've been given a great uh, uh, resource here, um, significant amount of money. It's going to allow us to expand in a couple new countries, and we have to decide where we're going to go. Um, and I think if you look at the most valuable ingredient in this, it's leadership and leadership that holds their systems accountable. So when we look at where we want to deploy that money, local strong local leadership, commitment to the health sector. Um, I think is going to be our, our top, prior, uh, top priority. 
Thank you very much. Since we're out of time, can I can I still give quickly oh, sure, the, the answer to why our uh, why our clients would be interested in this? Four reasons. I tried very hard to find three, but it's actually four. So one, um, it's tried and tested. Okay, this is these guys have been successful in the past, uh, and that's a very very important point. Second, it's scale. Okay, we are not talking about two thousand uh, people that we're addressing in a in a in a village with a healthcare center. It's thirty four million people. Um, third, and I think this is really important to understand, for every two dollars that our clients give, they activate an additional four. One from us and three from that community of, of extraordinary philanthropists who have started this challenge with, uh, with these two gentlemen. And last but not least, um, through the Optimus Foundation, they get reporting and controlling. So they get numbers and they also are ensured that what's being done is being done in the right way. Um, one thing maybe that I would add to the point that you guys just mentioned, the other thing that we can bring to the table and that we do bring to the table on occasion in, in, in um, ventures like this is that through the institution UBS, we can help you know, organizations like this to actually talk with governments, to open doors, and to bring another you know, voice to the table in terms of pushing um, for change. Thank you very much. Uh, Chuck Rausch, you have about uh, 1,500 business leaders uh, to, to hunt over the next uh, two days to follow the good example of UBS uh, and, uh, and about 300 uh, government ministers to talk to. So we won't keep you any longer. Thank you very much uh, for your wonderful work. Uh, thank you to UB UBS for supporting this work. And thank you for being here today on this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.